Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you about um, mechanisms, mechanisms and the micromacro link. So here we go. This is the plan for today. I'm going to follow up on fallacies that we talked about the last time and then jump into mechanisms. And then, you know, on the last three parts, I want to really talk about James Coleman's boat as like a, as like a way of thinking about how we connect the macro and the micro level with each other. Uh, and in that regard, I'm briefly going to, uh, to talk about the Protestant ethic in between, simply because, uh, well, it's a classic that everybody should know anyway, but also James Coleman used that, used that uh, um, idea from Max Weber and kind of embedded it or kind of laid it out in his schema of how we connect the macro with the micro, yeah? about how Protestantism leads to capitalism and how the whole thing goes through individuals. Okay, so fallacies. So a uh, quick uh, reminder, ecological fallacy, great exam question, what is an ecological fallacy? It's really that based on group level data, we cannot make specific statements about the individuals that form these groups. That's a bit counterintuitive. Of course, you can, I don't know, you have like a, I don't know, just because uh, people wear glasses doesn't mean that they are intelligent, even if on average people who wear glasses are more intelligent. You know, that's, that's sort of like a really weird thing. But you cannot just pick one individual then and kind of conclude. And the, the big mistake here is that you kind of take a macro correlation, you apply it, and you, you pretend that there's a micro correlation with it as well. So that's the ecological fallacy, uh, a special case of the ecological fallacy of Simpson's paradox. Simpson's paradox is this weird phenomena that we have where a trend appears in several different groups of data, but uh, the strength then seems to disappear or reverses when the groups are combined. And how the hell did that work? Uh, keep in mind, this is sort of how it is. There we have like X and Y, and it seems like X and Y are negatively associated with each other, negatively correlated with each other, right? But kind of one view, I actually look at the groups, it seems like how in a moment, there's actually a positive correlation between the two things. Now uh, you see how this goes. And practically, this could be, I don't know, a far-reaching conflict uh, when you think about how um, the socioeconomic status uh, of people is related with performance in schools, for example. But you forget about the school as a grouping level, right? Or you forget about the teacher as a grouping level, and so on. So that's another, it's a special case of an ecological fallacy. Again, you see now, actually, we have like the overall thing, and we have like the group data, where you, on the one level, you cannot conclude on the other one, or you need to be careful of these kind of things. Okay, so it's about confusing the different levels. And so it's easy to look and confuse uh, an answer on the wrong level when you try to make an explanation. And even more so, even if you kind of, let's say you take things apart, you know, you dissect, uh, you really try to understand what's, what's going on here, and you have all the different parts lined out, even then, Hopefully you're going to see throughout this whole lecture that even then you still can't, can't be absolutely sure what's going to happen at the macro level. Why? Because it's not just an aggregation. It's not just adding up what individuals do and that kind of tells you what society does. Yeah. Okay, I have some more examples about that later today, but then also a whole other lecture about it. So let's really talk about mechanisms. So what do we mean with mechanisms? So again, we kind of start with how do we make an explanation? Yeah, okay. And maybe your original thought was, well, you know, this one is actually not a bad one. Actually, it's been around for quite a while. It's called the deductive nomological model. I already talked about that. We have an explanans, we have an explanandum. And what we do here is we kind of see, okay, well, if the one thing is, then always the other thing happens. Yeah? It's a bit like finding this correlation. The one goes up, the other one goes up. In a way. And then you say, yay, I explained it. Yeah. But that's not really true. That's not really true, because you, kind of, you didn't really look at, the, uh, at, at how you get from the one to the other. And well, if there's fire and there's more, you might think, OK, well, that's actually pretty straightforward. You're, in, your, in your head, there's sort of a, a mechanism going on in a way. But technically speaking, you really just correlated two things with each other. And correlation is not causation. Now, two things being linked to each other, that doesn't mean that there's a causal link between these two. And to bring that home even more, you know, who better can say this than Homer Simpson? He has like this great example. It's great for teaching. And um, so what I have here, hang on, I have a little video that I want to show you. Our first issue, sir, is our low productivity and record high worker accident rate. Any suggestions? Round of the 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 round of the
That's why I brought the promise to you. You. I think I can do it. How will you win the world situation? Well, 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 sir, sir. One thing we had a problem with Tuesday when the cat deteriorated. He said, "What's going on?" Well, sir, I had to head off. Chop up the red red stick. It would seem red. To the point. Well, you only get this tiny little cup of tartar sauce to dip it in, and I always run out and stop wasting my time. Can't you see what he's saying? I have to go as a busy worker. Three things with a tart tart sauce. Could save us thousands of men hours of labor. I like to cut a few kitchens. Let the fools have their tart tart sauce. Enjoy your journey, good boy. Enjoy. If your brain is so dry, let him burn everybody. Brilliant. Who could have ever imagined that Simpson's sweeping reforms would pay off so quickly? You know, no, no, Rex, Rex can reach by exactly the number that Simpson himself is known and expected to have caused all that. And the rubble level was just as high as Rex Simpson's last take in. I did, I was with this. Do I need to know the Kennedy? Okay, so you see, if you would just look at the correlation, there's more tartar sauce, there are fewer accidents, right? I say, yeah, yeah, I explained it. Tartar sauce, uh, more tartar sauce leads to fewer accidents. But obviously, this is nonsense, you know, because there is no mechanism out right here. You know, you kind of, you don't really need, and, and actually what is going on here, something that we call spurious correlation, because there's a third factor that kind of affects both of these two things. So if you would have thought about the mechanism, how you get from one to the other, you would have realized that, hang on, there's something fishy here. There's something odd, because I don't really have a clear way of how I get from the, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from the, um, uh, from the explanatory to the explanatory. So we do need to think about the mechanism in between, yeah, in order to make an explanation. Because if we just correlate things with each other and we observe that again and again and again, that doesn't mean that we explain something. So we need to think about the mechanism. And the mechanism is now thinking about how do we get to it? Yeah? Like how does something come about? It applies this idea of a generative process of how we explain something. So a mechanism, you know, there's now a definition that I use from, from Peter Hetzler and, and Petty Ilikowski in their annual review paper. Uh, you guys had to read the, the chapter by Peter Hetzler and, and Richard Swedberg. Uh, there they kind of uh, outlined the idea of a mechanism before. This is sort of like the review paper that came afterward at some point. So a mechanism, they say, it consists of entities with their properties. So what are entities? Entities is really, I don't know, it could be people, it could be organization, institutions, you know, like sort of different actors that we have there. And the activities that these entities engage in, so they do something either by themselves or in concert with other entities. So it's not just what they do by themselves, but also how they relate with each other. So there's a lot of things in it. Uh, below we have the definition from, from, from the hetzel Melikowski uh, paper. A mechanism is a constellation of entities and activities that are organized such that they regularly bring about a particular type of outcome. So that doesn't mean that whenever you have the same entities, that then the same, it's about regularly bring about this outcome. Yeah? So it's not, so that's sort of where the social sciences are often a bit fuzzy. You know? They are fuzzy because people are fuzzy. People, people are not, I don't know, they don't always make sense. They don't always kind of you know, follow your theory or kind of, or they don't, they, there's just so much randomness that happens in there, right? So that here we have to apply this idea of regularly bring about. While in contrast, for example, in physics, when you boil water up to 100 degrees, you know it's going to, uh, it's going to evaporate. Now, that's sort of just what, what every time you will, it will happen. Unless, you know, and there we go already with the caveats, unless there's a different pressure, for example, right? Unless you're kind of, I don't know, up in an airplane and you boil water, you need actually fewer, uh, you don't need 100 degrees to boil water, right? Because there's less pressure. Uh, so you see how these other things come into, into play, but these other factors are often they can be grasped in a better way than in the social sciences, where so many other things matter. So a mechanism of these activities, they bring about change, and the type of change brought uh, about depends on the properties and activities of these entities, but around the relations between them. But you already see where there's a so, so they're entities, and they are related with each other. Yeah? And together, they bring about uh, what we observe. But I have more examples about that. So now the question is, how do we link different things together? So in the last lecture, we talked about the macro level and the micro level, and hopefully you got that difference here. But now you are aware of that. So whenever you kind of see something reported in the newspaper, or whenever you see something talked about in a paper or in a book, you understand, okay, at which level is that statement? 
You know, like, this is like a statement about the macro level, this is a statement about the micro level, and when or how do people kind of make mistakes of linking these things to each other. So we try to take things apart, you know, in making an explanation, and, and then, you know, this is sort of where, as I said, the last time where I think the real value added of sociology comes in, and now here's a quote by, by Dwight Heim, but, um, but you know, it was, the whole idea was, uh, Greek philosophers talked about this as well, but in the quote by Durkheim, it says, the whole does not equal the sum of, the, of its parts. It is something different, whose properties differ from those displayed by the parts from which it is formed. And so this is still a little abstract, but it means like, okay, where you have, let's say, a whole bunch of individuals, and you have like a group of individuals, the group is not just the aggregation, it's not just the summation of the individuals. <coughs> Max Weber talked in a similar way. He said, like, social phenomena must be explained by showing how the result from individual actions. So social phenomena. Social phenomena is the macro thing. Yeah? Whatever that is. I don't know. Uh, you know, Durkheim looked at suicide rates. And then Max Weber looked at capitalism. We come back to that later on. But he says, like, it must be explained by showing how they result from individual actions. So he says, I don't know, it's, we, we shouldn't just link things at the macro level to each other. If you think about how they are brought about by individual actions which in turn must be explained through reference to the intentional states that motivate the individual actors. So in here, there's already a Coleman board in here. You know, I don't know, you see later on what I mean by that. But he says, like, the social phenomena, we need to think about the individual actions that bring that about. And the individual actions themselves, they need to be thought about the states and that kind of motivate those individuals and how they come about. Yeah? And there you see how macro situations again affect individuals. Uh, Robert K. Burton, he says he is more explicit about this link than says sociology must deal with micro and macro level phenomena and develop concepts, methods, data for linking micro and macro analysis. And this is where I think where the real value added is in sociology that other disciplines don't really do is linking these things together. Right? Okay, there's another one from Hitzem and Dane about structural individualism, but you know, there really is the idea, you know, there was this thing, maybe you came across methodological individualism before, the kind of individuals really drive things. Structural individualism is this idea that individuals don't act in a sort of vacuum, yeah, but actually, you know, there are macro conditions that kind of affect people's lives, yeah, and then that kind of affects their intentions or whatever they kind of do, and then their individual behavior and so on, which then again affects macro level outcomes. So individuals are embedded constraints uh, by social structure, but there are also opportunities for that. Uh, but that's sort of how these two things link with each other and shouldn't be seen in separation from each other. Yeah, so micro and macro, whenever somebody comes along now and says, oh, I do micro sociology, or the other guy says, oh, I only do macro sociology, you should, be, you, should, you should think, hang on, you can't really look at these things in separation from each other. That's too simple. Yeah. Because if you just look at the macro level, uh, you don't really understand what is, of, I don't know, you're not really aware of the mechanism that kind of includes the actors in there, but when you kind of only look at how individuals behave, you, you don't really care or don't really look at what are society level outcomes that uh, result from that. Okay, but hopefully this gets a little more clearer in a bit. So now what I want to do, now I want to take a slight detour, and I briefly want to talk about the Protestant ethic because James Coleman, uh, kind of use that as an example to illustrate uh, his micro-macro scheme that we'll talk about. So who has ever heard about the Protestant ethic by Max Weber? Hands up. Oh, lots of people. That's great. Yeah. So Max Weber, you know, if you haven't come across the guy, it's another dude with a beard, um, uh, as uh, most of the sociologists back in those days were. Max Weber is one of the founding fathers of the discipline. I was a German sociologist. And he wrote uh, the Protestantische Ethik und der Geist des Kapitalismus, so the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. And his, his starting question really was, where does capitalism come from? You know, this was sort of you know, like an, around 1900, capitalism started to really uh, take over, uh, and he was, he was concerned about where does it come from. Well, actually, Max Weber was concerned about even some other things. He, he wrote a lot about rationalization in bureaucracies, and maybe you came across him in that regard, Zweckrationales Handeln and all these kind of things, a bit of different modes of behaviors. And he, he wanted to understand how did we end up with this rationalization um, uh, of action uh, where traditions got abandoned. And that's what he observed. I think about the 1900, big cities starting to take over, industrialization happens, 
uh, traditional ways of life suddenly disappear. There's actually even another book by uh, Georg Simmel, which is lovely in that regard, Großstädte und das Geistesleben in Großstädte, something like that. It's about the, I don't know, um, living in big cities. And, and you read that and you think, God, this guy, he wrote that 100 years ago. You know, he should have, you would have thought he wrote it yesterday. So he, he writes about how people living in big cities, how that really changes the way you relate to other people, how that kind of uh, takes, them, takes them out of, uh, of, 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 of their cultural embedment, you know, about their social environment, how they become isolated, how they become blasé. And these are all things that we observe. Where nowadays you live in cities, God, I live in a big an apartment block and I don't know any one of my neighbors. Right? And uh, I don't know, you'd say maybe it's because I'm a really unso uns uh, asocial guy, but I don't think I am. And, uh, but that's just how it is nowadays. Right? But back in the days, my grandma, she knew everybody who lived in the whole streets. Okay, so Max Weber, he tried to uncover the forces uh, and he, f he looked at that in different areas and he kind of saw, okay, that actually happened in the West more than in elsewhere. So he kind of tried to uncover the forces in the West that caused people to abandon their traditional religious value orientation and encourage them to develop you know, this desire to acquire more goods and wealth. So where does this come from, that people now want to make money? Yeah? And uh, you know, he came to this, uh, to this uh, conclusion, you know, he, looked at, he looked at this all over the world, so he didn't just study the West, but he also looked at, uh, at uh, uh, Far East cultures uh, and elsewhere, and he kind of came up with this hypothesis. Keep in mind, this is an hypothesis. Now, this is like his best guess, in a way. Again, this is not like this is how it is. This is not set in stone. This is like what his best guess was, but actually, you know, it turns out it's a, it's a pretty convincing guess. It's a pretty good idea. So that's why we stick with it. Um, and his, his hypothesis was that the Protestant ethic broke the whole of tradition while it encouraged people to apply themselves rationally to their work. So the idea here was that Calvinism, you know, it's like a form of, of Protestantism that kind of uh, back in the days was popular in the Netherlands or in Switzerland, for example. They found that Calvinism had developed a set of beliefs around the concept of predestination. as like being selected by God, right? Uh, and uh, it was believed by followers of Calvin that one could not do good works or perform acts of faith to assure your place in heaven. So it's kind of, it's kind of, it's actually different. It's sort of, you cannot really, you cannot really change your life to, to, um, so that you have a higher chance to get into heaven. You know, that's, that's like the idea here. Um, but the idea is you've already been selected by God to begin with, right? Either you get into heaven or not, but your whole life you don't really know. Uh, and then the only way you can find out is kind of like, uh, um, it's kind of like whether you kind of have been elected or not, uh, you know, you can take wealth as a sign for that. Right. So the, the idea is that uh, however wealth was taken as a sign by you and your neighbors that you were one of God's elect, thereby providing encouragement for people to acquire health. So the Protestant ethic therefore provided religious sanctions that fostered a spirit of religious discipline, encouraging people to apply themselves and work uh, hard. So it's this idea of predestination. Yeah? So I've been selected by God, yes or no, right? That's my fate already. Yeah? I don't really know, but I want to find out. And the way I can find out is kind of looking for these signs. And these signs are sort of whether I kind of, one of the signs is like I use my time to honor God. And I honor my time to God by kind of not wasting my time that I could, you know, that God has given me. That's sort of like this idea. So he looked at that and, uh, you know, he, he kind of then, and, well, that's his idea, you know, but, but how did he actually go about that, you know? And he, he, he compared different cultures with each other, and he found this correlation, he found this correlation between capitalism on the one side and Protestantism on the other side. So, or, or in the other way, or the, uh, formulated another way, he didn't find capitalism in countries in the Far East, for example. There was no Protestantism there. So that was like his thinking, hang on, maybe Protestantism is missing there, so maybe that's why. There is no capitalism that developed. And it was in line with these ideas of predestination that I just outlined. You know, that kind of is like being selected, and that this is sort of like the way to see whether God uh, has been chosen you or not. So that was just kind of thinking, but to summarize this, I don't know, uh, I have a little video that probably summarizes this better than, than how I did. Yeah. So let's watch this little video. <laughs> The 
Those who pursue religion often turn away from worldly affairs. Their suspicious wealth and business prefer an ascetic life of contemplation and prayer. The sociologist and economist Max Weber argued that after the Reformation, one form of Christian Protestantism, Calvinism, encouraged a different attitude to work with far-reaching effects. Calvinists believed in predestination. A precise number of souls would go to heaven. The lucky ones had places reserved by God. However, However, most of the guests were terrified there would be no seats awaiting them in paradise. paradise. They, were they were always on the lookout for signs, signs that they, they had been saved. saved. One, One clear indication that they were on the guest list was that they were actively contributing to their community through their work. In his book, book The Protestant Ethic of the Spirit of Capitalism, spirit of capitalism Weber, Weber argued that the Calvinists' need, need to reassure themselves through their industry was an important factor in the, in the growth, growth of capitalism in Northern Europe. Europe. They built up these businesses that generated wealth, wealth, but at the same, same time lived thrifty, thrifty lives. lives. They, they reinvested in any service and so helped to fuel the capitalism. Eventually, Eventually, capitalism, capitalism would have a life and momentum of its own, but according to Weber, at least its initial impetus came from a theological source. source. Okay, so, so that's, uh, I don't know, the Protestant ethic in a nutshell, you know, it's like really, really in a nutshell. Uh, if you take one thing out of it, it's like it links Protestantism, or more precisely Calvinism in this case, with capitalism on the other side, and the idea is that people kind of are the lookout, whether they are selected by God or not, right? And when you, let's say you are a waster, let's say you, 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 I don't know, you don't really use your time efficiently, you kind of just dilly-dally around and, uh, and things like that. That kind of, that, in, that, in that theory, I mean, it's like, hang on, you, you cannot be elected by God because you're wasting the time that God has given you, in a way, right? So you should actually, uh, while in contrast, if you're a person who kind of works hard, you know, kind of applies him or herself for the betterment of the community in a way as a sign that you are elected by God. So that's how these things relate with each other. But why do we talk about the Protestant ethic here now? Well, we talk about it because of James Coleman's boat. So James Coleman, James Coleman was a, a sociologist in Chicago, actually, and he, in a nutshell, he kind of gave us this picture. Yeah? And this picture, as you see, we have macro things that are related with each other, macro phenomena, and now maybe in your head just replace the one thing with Protestantism and the other thing with Calvinism, right? It's like the macro things that we read with each other. But kind of but just drawing the, drawing the line, the arrow directly from the, that kind of misses out, right? Because how does Protestantism lead to capitalism? Yeah. So we need to think about the people that are involved in there that actually do something. And this is where the micro level comes into play. So James Coleman in the Foundations of Social Theory, it's like, you know, I can encourage you guys to read that. Uh, it's like the, it's the first few chapters, or the first chapter talks about that. Uh, it's very straightforward to read. And he kind of takes Max Weber's idea and he puts it in this schema. So we have Protestant uh, uh, religious doctrine, you know, uh, Protestantism on the, on, on the left, on the top, and we have capitalism on the other side. And, okay, so how do we get to that? So now James Coleman outlines, he just really takes what Weber talked about, but Weber didn't really formulate it as explicitly as that, right? He says, okay, well, hang on, Protestant religious doctrine that kind of affects individuals' values. Yeah. What I think kind of what is, what is being valued uh, in the world. And that kind of, that effect in turn, and now we are at the micro level, that in turn affects how I behave. That kind of leads to economic behavior, right? I have this idea of, values of predestination and because of that I kind of I work very hard that's sort of like I don't work very hard because of Protestantism I work hard because I think Protestantism entails this idea that I can look for signs of God that I've been elected or not by kind of living an ascetic life and that kind of then leads to this behavior that uh, that I um, uh, that I show uh, and that it's an economic behavior so I save money I work hard you know I don't waste my time and now the next thing comes into play, and this is actually the area where James Coleman says where, where the least work has been done. Actually now more and more work has been done in that area. It's like when we link that up again. So what happens when many people, when many people kind of uh, live an ascetic life? 
you know, they work very hard. Uh, they kind of look at how they use their time and try to maximize their loss. What happens if everybody does that? Well, then kind of we end up with capitalism. That's the idea. Now you see how we link these two macro phenomena with each other um, by going through the micro level below. And the whole thing is called James Coleman's boat because it looks a little bit like a boat. Funnily, in the German-speaking uh, world, it's often called uh, Bad Wanne, because it looks like a bathtub a little bit. Uh, it's like the boat idea. That's how, uh, how it's often referred to in the English-speaking world. But it really is like this, this, um, uh, uh, this schema that we have here, how things are related with each other. This is now, again, from Peter Hellström and, and Piotr Elikowski. OK, situational mechanisms, that's sort of like how I, how I kind of uh, uh, experience the situation that I'm in, right? And, and that can actually, you know, I've done some work about how being embedded in networks really kind of has an effect on what I see. Uh, so actually how, how you see the really wrong things. So in, in, I don't know, the people, in your friends, people's life, there's always more things happening, you know, that, I don't know. People kind of put themselves in relation with each other because of the social structure that they are embedded in. And that kind of then affects like my, my ideas about I don't know, but my own life, for example. So there you see how a macro phenomena can affect uh, the micro level, the situation. And then once you kind of have an individual that experiences the situation in a certain way, you have what, uh, what the, the two Peters call um, uh, action formation mechanisms. It's like that's individual behavior. So I experience the world in a certain way, and because of that, I behave. You know, you see how this already is different from how the world really is. Because it really matters how I experience the world for what I do. And then we have transformational mechanism, which link the whole thing up again when individuals behave together in a certain way. But again, to, uh, to explain this a little more, this is a longer video. Uh, so gonna you know, this is actually the institute where I used to work before, before I came here to Dublin. So let's watch this for my Swedish colleagues, which has a great Swedish accent. Sociology is the study of how social world works, especially in social groups like this, communities, organizations, and groups, because they can be called macro social reality. Individual human beings are the crucial component of these macro scale social formations. Individuals and their interactions are the micro social reality. Many of the central questions in sociology are related to relations between macro and micro. Social structure as an institution influence how individuals think and behave. However, nothing made the social world works without individual action. After all, the large scale social formations are basically made of individuals and their social relations. The society is not a mere sense of individuals. How do macro-facts depend on facts about individuals? This is what sociologists wish to understand. The Cocoa Diagram, or the Cocoa Boat, is an intellectual tool designed to help to think about these micro-macro relations. It was made famous by James Cocoa, an influential American sociologist. This is the show how the diagram works. Let us first take a look at the components. At the top, we have the macro social reality, and at the bottom, there is an individual age. The diagram is flex, depending on whether we are interested in groups, organizations, or nations. We can choose that as the macro scale. The micro only consists of an individual person, but in some applications, the micro age can also be family, firms, or other organized groups. When using the diagram, the starting point is a relation between macro groups A and D. The are four factors to have a hypothetical causal relation between them. With the help of the diagram, we can study why such causal relation makes sense. This is done by reconstructing the underlying causal mechanism. Understanding the mechanism is important for two reasons. First, the absence of a sensible and empirically supported mechanism raises serious doubt about the causal relation. Second, the mechanism provides explanatory understanding. Understanding how the cause produces the effect is the key for scientific phenomenon. 
Thus, Thus universal, universal basic, basic income can increase, increase or decrease social inequality. This is a causal claim by macro social facts that can be used as an illustration. In the dialogue, the introduction of the basic income by the government would be the node A, the change in social inequality, the node D. The Arab form that represents the subsequent causal relation, the relevant micro agent would be individuals and families. The first step in the reconstruction mechanism is to figure out how the background change influences an individual. This is the Arab one. The macro change can transform the opportunities and incentives of the individual. It can also influence her values or desires. For example, the introduction of the basic income could change the individual's level of income, her relationship with her progress, and evidence about the life expected. It is also possible that the basic income changes the skills and abilities of the individual by influencing her educational choices. All these multiple influences are registered at the node B. The same language change can influence different individuals differently. In the case of basic income, persons, employment status, level of income, and age make important differences. For this reason, it's not sufficient to assume that any individual can represent the whole population. The causal influence of A on B is mediated by structural and institutional background conditions. The same policy change can have very different consequences in different institutional contexts. While these background conditions are not represented in the dialogue, one of its purposes is to help social scientists think about them. The next step is the Arab two. It covers the theory of an individual. Do the changes in B have behavioral consequences? If so, what are they? In the case of basic income, we can assume that changes in work-related incentives will affect the behavior of some individuals, but will changes in social expectations also have behavioral consequences? Here, sociologists can be held by psychological theories and findings, but quite often they have to rely on their own common sense. The behavior of assumptions matter, but they can be empirically tested. The note C leaves us with changes in individual behavior to complete our sociological analysis. We have to get back to macro social facts. This is covered by the area 3. According to Cohen, this micro to macro link has been neglected in sociological theory. It is still quite common to assume that the macro outcome is a mere aggregate or an average of the micro. One of the reasons for this is the interdependence of micro actions. The behavior of an individual depends on how other individuals behave. This feedback loop can be represented by the area part. In this loop, the original changes in behavior bring about new changes in B. If the labor market participation goes down, it becomes easier to find a new job and the salaries will go up. This will affect the behavior of the people still in the labor market. If part-time working becomes more common, more people would find it an acceptable alternative. However, if the number of people working goes down, that would also affect how much taxes the government can collect. This would affect the level of basic income the society can provide. These interdependencies make the social analysis both exciting and difficult. Only by understanding how they work, it is possible to make sense of the micro ruling. What is the effect of basic income and social inequality will depend on these details. This video has shown how the Coleman diagram can be used to analyze complex social processes. The diagram is not a summary of any particular sociological theory. It is a device for making it easier to see what kind of theories we need. Okay, there, there, there are several interesting things in this small little video here. Um, uh, even if we just start at the very beginning about why should we care about this, uh, looking at the macro and the micro, you know, why should we think about the causal mechanism? And, you know, there were two reasons given. One was actually, if you don't have a causal mechanism, the kind of links, I don't know, if there's fire, there's smoke, if you don't have a causal mechanism for that, you know, that kind of raises real doubts whether actually that really is a true uh, correlation that we have, you know, whether, the, whether there is like a, a causality between the two things. Uh, so you need to think about how you get from the one to the other. Without that, you know, there's real, real, real doubts about whether that actually is the case. Um, and the next one is it kind of it, it gives explanatory value. Now, by just correlating things with each other, you haven't explained anything. 
You need to think about how do I get from the one to the other. And instead of how you add explanatory value to, um, a cor to, to an association that you observe. Okay, but then even the next thing, you know, and uh, the next thing that came up was that only individuals can act. You know, that might, might seem trivial in a way, but kind of keep in mind, you know, that some sociologists don't think like that. They kind of think that, I don't know, they're institutions and they do something, yeah? Or they are higher entities that sort of exist somehow. I'm always skeptical when these things happen. Of course, there's like a simplification in that regard. Here we can look at that. But, but to say that institutions do something, no, they don't do something. It's kind of individuals that are exposed to the institutions. Or they kind of then behave in there. You know, of course, they're, kind of, they're highly constrained by that. But that just means that you have to link the macro and the micro level together. You know, you shouldn't look at them separately. But kind of saying that social uh, facts uh, are kind of directly lead to other social outcomes, I think that's just that's nonsense. That doesn't really make sense. Uh, because how, at the end, you need to have somebody doing something and, uh, um, and, and individuals do something. So that's the other thing. And then, and then it kind of, I don't know, it talks a little bit more in detail about how, okay, we have the macro situation, the example of, I don't know, basic income, about how it affects uh, individuals, situa there's like the situational mechanism. Let's say universal income, everybody would get a certain income. We don't have to work, right? I don't know, we don't, everybody gets, a paycheck at the end of the month. And kind of a, that affects my thinking. You know, that's, oh, great. You know, I, can, I, don't have to, I don't have to think about, I don't know, getting money so I can pay food. I can, I can just get that, you know. Now suddenly, you know, I can, I can think about, okay, what else would I want to do? So you see how this affects my situation. And then we are at the individual level. Yeah, and let's say, I don't know, I, I, we get a universal income, individual sort of, I have that situation. That means, okay, now I can actually do what I want. So now I can spend my time and go to sociology classes. Because, yeah. let's face it, I'm not going to get a lot of money with that. So, uh, so you better have a universal income to begin with. Little joke at the side. No, uh, there are good jobs out there. Um, but um, you see how this then affects individual behaviors. Let's say everybody does that. Let's say everybody then goes to sociology classes, well, we would have to have go to a large lecture theater in a while. But then also the effects, and uh, you know, there was a, a nice little feedback loop that you saw in that regard. You know, that, let's say if, if nobody really works anymore, then actually for those people who do want to work, you know, they probably have more job opportunities to begin with. Because all those other students sit in sociology lectures. You know? um, and that kind of is like this feedback, which then affects again, like how individuals change their situations or the situation that they are in, which then kind of leads to how they can then act in a way. Then I could actually get a different kind of job because there's more, uh, more demand for, for skill play, for example, that isn't fulfilled uh, by uh, the supply because fewer people are in the labor force because there's universal income. So you see, and then kind of how that kind of then leads to, uh, to social outcomes again, or that how can, how can that lead them to, in this case, it was social inequalities. Okay, so this is a tool, you know, that we can use. It's not a theory. Yeah. It's like a tool that we can use to kind of see about, okay, where are we here? And where do the different theories come into place? And, you know, as outlined often, I don't know, we draw, I draw on, on psychological theories, I don't know, or social psychological theories to understand how conditions for individual actions lead to individual action. Yeah. But that doesn't mean I study that. You know, I kind of I build that on others. You know, they work on that. But then I'm kind of mostly concerned about how social facts lead to change the conditions for individual action, but also like if individuals behave in a certain way, how does it lead to social outcomes? And you see how can actually one can go further and further down on that, right? So let's say, I don't know, uh, you come up with an idea about how universal income leads to inequalities on the other side, and the, at the micro level, you have like individuals, a theory about how individuals behave based on the uh, <coughs> economic situation that you're in, then you can actually go further down. You know, kind of, okay, this is now a theory there, and then, I don't know, the psychologists come into play. I think about individuals for interactions, but these are the macro phenomena there, they lead to how, I don't know, cognitive action works, you know, like how, what's going on in my brain. And then you can even go further down, you know, again, these are like the macro conditions for the biochemist and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is a tool. We can link the macro and the micro together. I have some other examples for that. Uh, now, two uh, examples very briefly. So hopefully you get now that the macro situation can affect how individuals live their life, right, the, the situation that they are in, which then forms the foundation for how they behave. And this can work in different ways. 
So this can either work in the form of constraints. We live in a society that has cultural norms. I don't know, so I cannot, I cannot just show up here in my Bermuda short, in my shorts, or so on, because it would look a little odd. Yeah? So you see how that kind of constrains my behavior here right now. Yeah? So I don't do that. Uh, there's a constraint. But at the same time, we have opportunities as well. So differential access to opportunities among, I don't know, individuals in, in social structure and, and opportunities can, can also affect of the macro on the micro, right? Imagine you are not in a Western country or imagine you are, come from a family background that doesn't allow you to go to the university. In a way. You see, these are sort of now, uh, constraints uh, or flipping it around opportunities. Yeah, let's say you come from a, from, from a background that allows you to go to university instead of, I don't know, having a day job yeah, to, uh, to, 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 to earn money. So that's how opportunities and constraints come into play. One example that I sometimes use is like uh, this study by Samuel Stauffer. It was like a classic study, really one of those classic studies that if you want to read some classics in sociology, read that one, uh, The American Soldier. Uh, the reason for that is it was like a, at the very beginning, it's like one of the big, first big empirical studies where actually sociologists went out and collected data instead of just talking about society like Weber did, yeah? I don't know, or, or, or others before him, you know, they just blabbered around a lot yeah, um, without being systematic about collecting data and kind of basing their results on that. And Stauffer, he kind of basically had a research team that was embedded during the Second World War with the American troops. And, you know, they looked at all sorts of things. But one thing that kind of they did find uh, was a really odd phenomenon where soldiers with low opportunities for promotion had a more favorable opinion towards these opportunities than soldiers with high promotion opportunities. So people who could not, were in a unit where they could not get promoted, they were actually more excited about the promotion. While in the other way around, if people kind of were in an environment where lots of people got promoted, where the promotion rate was high, and they didn't get promoted, you can see how that affects the individual sentiment. Because they hang on, everybody else gets promoted, but I. Uh, so so, so what's, what's going on here? Well, if people were not exposed to a high promotion rate to begin with, they thought much more positively about it to begin with. So there you see how the macro, it's just another example of how the macro affects how individual, individual sentiment and so on. Uh, another one is about, how, well then when we go from the micro to the macro, and again kind of these two links are the, are the most exciting ones, yeah, uh, I think for social scientists. Um, and we have like two lectures on that. It's about segregation. And segregation is this weird phenomena. This, well, it's not a weird phenomenon, this is our map of New York from based on the 2000s and I don't know. Um, you see the different parts of New York, you see you know, Staten Island, uh, then you see Manhattan, you see uh, Brooklyn on the right, and now it's kind of highlighted based on the uh, um, uh, ethnic comp uh, concentration in that area, it's like I don't know how many whites still live there, how many blacks live in a certain neighborhood, and so on, how many Hispanics, and so on. And when you look at that map, you should think about something, hang on a moment, there's a lot of segregation going on. There seems to be a white neighborhood. Yeah. Staten Island, Manhattan is almost entirely white. While then when you go into, into Brooklyn, you have completely black areas. You know? yeah, I don't know if you ever go to JFK, that area, I don't know, or you're up in the north, you have like Hispanic neighborhoods. It's a lot of segregation that we observe. And actually, you know, this segregation, segregation kind of even increases. Um, another example where you see that is Belfast. Belfast is a great example in that regard where you have religious segregation that even increased over the last 20 years or so. Now the question is where does that come from? And it comes from this thing that it's not just the outcome of individual's behavior, of individual choices to live somewhere in a certain way. So one plus one does not necessarily equal two. And here I have, now this is like a, like a toy model here, yeah? and we come back to that, it's what's called the shelling model, shelling model of segregation. Anybody heard about the shelling model of segregation before? Some folks have heard about it, yeah? probably in Pablo's social simulation class. Yeah. Anyway, so it's this very simple idea. You have like individual actors. They are like virtual agents right now, you know, like simulated people. They are either, there are two things. Either they are red or, 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 or blue, yeah? and they are either happy or unhappy. And yeah? so you have like these two combinations of things. And you see, you see here some, some, some blue individuals that are happy and some red individuals that are happy and, vice, and also like unhappy ones. Now we can have a simple rule, a very simple rule for individuals that say, let's say uh, 
you know, I'm, I'm fine with living in a diverse society. I just want to have at least 30% of the people around me to be similar to me. Yeah? So actually, I, you could even show that I would even prefer to be in a diverse society where things are mixed. But I want to have a certain amount of people that are similar to me. It's far less than half of it. But if you have that simple, simple rule for making people unhappy, you know, that's how I know what happens, really. I don't know, you're the, I don't know, or the, the or individuals, and you make them unhappy when they are uh, less than 30% similar individuals around them. And then they move. Then they move to an empty spot where no individual lives at random, right? And that kind of then changes the situation, and then you have other individuals act on that. And now the, the, the interesting thing is kind of when we kind of uh, let that play out, you know, it has actually, it leads to, you know, you see now individuals moving around, and uh, the result of that is that we create a world that is pretty segregated. You know, now you already see like completely red areas emerging, completely blue areas emerging. Right? So now actually, for most people, they will be surrounded by much more than 30% similar people. Actually, in some cases, we get almost complete segregation here happening, even though people would have been fine with, uh, with being surrounded by lots of different people. That's sort of like a prime example of how individual behaviors and uh, does not necessarily lead to the, to the macro outcome. I'm running out of time here. So individual preferences uh, to not be surrounded by others um, lead, can lead to, to racial segregation, which is not just the aggregation of individuals' behaviors. Okay, so we have James Coleman's boat. There we go. Uh, as I mentioned before, I think you need to have networks at the very core of it because that sort of is a way of how people are related to others for the whole thing to sail. Okay, so let's stop here for Thursday. We have the reading by James and Rebecca on the wisdom of crowds. See you on Thursday.